Harry and Harry's Wife. Netflix Analysis, Part 8. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. Well, stick a fork in your thigh to keep yourself awake. Electrocute a part of your body to zap yourself into consciousness. Snort a great big line of something in order to make your heart beat a bit faster, in order to keep you awake, because we're going to have to wade through the snooze fest, which is, of course, the Netflix docu-series, which does, of course, provide us with some understanding and material, which helps us know more about Harry's wife's narcissism. But it really is like panning for gold amongst a load of manure. Anyway, let us continue. The episode tells us that Harry and Harry's wife had dinner the following night after their first date, and apparently she was late. Apparently it was only by mere moments. But in the course of the interview, when Harry makes mention of the fact that his wife was late turning up for that date, that, of course, is a threat to control. And therefore, she has to reject that threat to control by saying, well, it was only a matter of minutes. And then to say, I hate being late, holding herself out as the angel of virtue that we all know her to be. We're then explained and shown a photograph and the photograph tells us that apparently that they wanted to capture the feeling of just sitting in that little restaurant and going, oh my gosh, I think we're going to give it a go. Yes, you had two dates. The first was, what, an hour long? And now you're on your second date and you've decided that you're going to give it a go. All I can anticipate is that Harry's wife gave Harry a blowy under the table and that his eyes rolled into the back of his head and he emptied the pink pods and placed in such a position of utter ecstasy that he thought, I've got to have some more of this, so I'll give it a go in order to ensure this happens. Because quite simply, to formulate a view that you're going to give it a go for a relationship based off just two dates, well... And then not exactly long dates either is demonstrative of not clear thinking. On his part, emotional thinking. His addiction to narcissism means that his emotional thinking soars, clouding his judgment. On her part, her narcissism just tells her, this guy is brilliant. You need to get him into a relationship. She, of course, isn't thinking, I need to get him into a relationship. She is just thinking, he's fun, he's exciting, he's kind, he's interesting, etc. All of that, part of the infatuation that is generated by her narcissism to compel her to get hold of and keep hold of him. But you can see now, looking back at it, through the cold light of day and also the understanding that my work brings you to say we wanted to take a photograph that captured the feeling of just sitting in that little restaurant and going oh my gosh I think we're going to give it a go it sounds ridiculous doesn't it it's magical thinking it sounds lovely and romantic initially but it isn't you don't capture that essence in a photograph in that way but, is this, but this is demonstrative of the way that a narcissist would think. Harry then picks up the baton, explaining, this girl, this woman, is amazing, everything I was looking for. The emotional thinking is high with this one. Then along comes somebody by the name of Silver Tree. Again, she's big on the vocal fry. And she explains that Harry's wife texted her afterwards, saying, Silver, I'm crazy about him. She's met him twice. But of course, this again is the typical response of a narcissist. I'm crazy about him. Crazy about what? You've met him twice. Got along, admittedly so. But he's putty in your hands. A more measured response would be, there's a lot about him that I like. I'm going to see him again and see how it goes. That, of course, would be a sensible and measured response. But you're not going to get that from the narcissist. The narcissist is driven by infatuation. And the assertion of control is being done here over Silver Tree, the non-intimate secondary source in the fuel matrix, by explaining that she's crazy about him in order to elicit the response of, well, that's great news, I'm so pleased for you. 
and also indirectly over Prince Harry. But then we're on to the next friend. It's Nacho. Yes, Ignacio Nacho Fugueras. And he explains that Harry said when he had dinner with him, guys, I met a girl we've just met, but um, I think this may be the one. Once again, demonstrative of the emotional thinking of the victim of the narcissist. We are then shown a picture and, as you will see on the screen, that Harry's smiling and he looks genuinely happy. Because he is. Because he thinks that he's met the woman of his dreams. He thinks that he's met his soulmate. But notice the dead-eyed response of Harry's wife in that picture and the slight smirk, demonstrative of the shark that has got its prey. Harry then moves on to bringing up making head versus heart decisions and explains how his mother, yes, for it is she, has made decisions from her heart. And we then go back to some footage which occurs in relation to the announcement of Harry's birth. Then we get some more pictures of Harry and the royal family and it's showing Diana talking about them and it's when William, I think, is three years old and Harry's one year old. So a little bit of a trip down memory lane going on at this juncture. Harry explains that he recalls a childhood filled with happiness and adventure and then says that he didn't have many early memories of his mother. It was almost like internally I blocked them out. Well, I wonder where he's got that phrase from, the therapy nonsense speak word salad that comes from Harry's wife, no doubt. There's more footage of him with his mother, the well-known log flume ride they went on. And he explained that the majority of his memories are being sworn by paparazzi. Well, I thought a moment ago his childhood was filled with happiness and adventure, but there we are. And it's now it's time to basically start lambasting the existence of the paparazzi. And Harry explains that the advice that's provided at this juncture is don't react and don't feed into it. So we had the early seed sown of how they came to meet, which, as I've explained, does appear to be a revision of history. And it's also far very much out of the narcissist playbook. He's amazing. I want to be with him. I'm crazy about him. Wow, she's ace. She's great. You know, I think she's the one. And it is the classic love bombing that goes on with her moving it ahead fast, with him falling prey to her that he finds himself driven by his own emotional thinking, believing that she's wonderful and the one, that she's broadcasting to everybody else how amazing it is that her infatuation caused by her narcissism causes her to believe that this is the man for her. It's straight out of the narcissist playbook of ensnarement. And of course, anybody else looking at it would just think, because they don't know about narcissism, oh, isn't it lovely? You know, they're falling, falling in love. They're so made for one another. Isn't this a, such a romantic story, love at first sight? Well, no, this is very much the story of a narcissist getting her victim, that intimate partner, primary source. She doesn't know it because she doesn't know she's a narcissist. He doesn't know it because he doesn't know what narcissism is. And he didn't realise they'd been caught as a victim of hers. But even in this part of the first episode, we see clearly that the bringing together between the two of them is very much that from the narcissist playbook. Let's move on and find out in part nine what more we can learn about this supposed love story vis-a-vis -vis narcissism. Join me there.